I just welcome everybody back from lunch. Uh, and I do realise, after being here for the last few days, that this is the time that most people are likely to fall asleep, but I'll try and keep you awake as we go. Um, I've been working at the IUCR now for 20 years, so I arrived at the time when SIF was just really beginning to take hold. Um, so I can't actually remember a time before SIF. Um, I work for the International Union of Crystallography. As you will, will know, we're an international scientific union. And we currently pu publish nine research journals. The three that I'm most interested in for these purposes are actors B, C and E, where we do a lot of small molecule um, publishing. And the driving force, behind, certainly in C and E, is CIF. Also, it's our remit to promote the standard crystallographic data file, or CIF. Now, those of you who saw John Helliwell's talk and Brian McMahon's this morning will have seen this diagram already. Um, it's a schematic of how data flows through the crystallographic process. Um, I'm going to be concentrating here on the ones in the thick lines from data reduction through to publication and dissemination to databases and the like. I've actually added one important line here after John Helliwell's talk this morning where we're talking about raw data which is being deposited and linked to from the final published article and this is the way things are going. Um, quite a scary diagram, this, but I'll try and give you an overview of it. This is how the various files flow in the publication system. Oops, sorry, done it again. Start with your experiment, you've got your raw data, which could be an image SIF format. Go through a process of data reduction, get structure factors. Structure refinement, out comes the SIF. So the SIF structure factors go to the author. The author will then, using their favourite tools, add text, any other information into the SIF, and along with the structure factors, submit those to the ICR in the first instance for validation. If they pass through the validation, which isn't just structural validation, it's also uh, duplication checking, see if the article's been, sorry, if the structure's been published before. If it passes through all that, it comes through to us for peer review. So we've still got the structure factors and the SIF, which are used as part of the review process, but also we form a PDF review of the article, various HTML files, including check SIF reports, which is a validation report, duplication reports, um, and various other things. Pass through the peer review system, accepted for publication. We come through for technical editing, but at this point, the editing is done on the SIF we don't edit the structure factors, but the structure factors come through and the SIF is technically edited. And ultimately, we go to publication, where the, the article of record is an SGML file. So the SIF, all, all the information in the SIF is converted to SGML. And from publication, all that data is then disseminated to the various um, chemical, chemistry databases, such as the CCDC, or in the case of inorganics, the ICSD, and various bibliographical databases, and onto our website where we publish p the traditional PDF of the article, various HTML files, and the SIF and the structure factors are freely available. Quick overview of the early development of SIF. Again, you've seen some of this, and some of this is actually in the, in the conference handout. It's a small section for our purposes, for my purposes. Before SIF, um, David Brown worked on the standard crystallographic file structure. This was a, a, lot of the, a lot of the work that was done there was fed in to the SIF. Now, as early as 1990, before we even had SIF, we actually checked the data coming to our journals using a various suites of programs such as XStyle, uh, NRC VAX. We keyboarded all the data and did that by hand. 1991, the first SIF dictionary was published. 
and in-house, Brian McMahon developed techniques for processing this SIF data to a typeset article. Within a year, we had our first unsolicited SIF submission, which we weren't expecting. Um, this speeded up the process, and we really had to do something to automatically work with these. And within two years, um, the workflow was in place that we could guarantee faster processing for any article that was submitted in SIF format. And by 1996, Atticus became a SIF-only uh, journal. You could only submit by SIF. So five, oops, five years from the first SIF to mandatory. It's quite quick. Benefits of SIF for us as publishers, um, there's a submission and deposition of structural and experimental data in a standard format, obviously a good thing to start with. It also, and this was quite um, forward thinking at the time, it contained the framework for publishing an article directly. There wasn't just the structural and experimental data in there, there was also text, or the ability to put text in. Um, standard format also allowed the possibility for automated validation checking against a set of known standards. And also duplication checking against relevant structural databases. This, is, this could all be automated now. Um, collecting all this data, the SIFs and the structure factors, also helps in fraud detection, um, which I'll come to a little bit later. It has been mentioned this morning as well. What's validation? Well, it's a comparison of your data against a set of test criteria. Simple things like, are the usually expected data and information present? Have you got your cell parameters? Well, of course you're going to have your cell parameters, but it'll check that. Um, are related parameters consistent? Does the cell volume match the cell parameters? Doesn't always, or didn't, I mean, it does now, but there was a time when it wasn't the case. Is the space group correct? Has the refinement converged? Are the assigned atom types correct? And is the structure reasonable? And going back to uh, duplication, has it been determined before? That's it. The automation of validation allows authors to instantly get anonymous and instant feedback. We have the Check SIF service on the web, um, which anybody can go and use. It's freely available, and you get, when I say instant feedback, fairly. It, some large structures will take a few seconds to run, but it's fairly instantaneous. It allows authors to detect and hopefully fix problems prior to submission, which can lead to fewer and shorter revision cycles. There's a consistent set of applied criteria. These are published, they're freely available, there are no hidden hurdles that you have to jump. It allows the editors and referees to focus on the science and the benefit, which is what everybody wants, faster publication times. Now, Tony Linden's going to talk afterward, uh, after me about um, validation of SIFs, so I'll just quickly skip through this slide um, about what validation software does, but I'll, I will draw your attention to these points at the bottom. It isn't intended as a hurdle to make life difficult. Um, we don't want to hinder the publication of correct results. It's a set of criteria to make, possibly sometimes make you think again, oh, maybe that hasn't been done quite correctly, or... Yes, it has been done correctly, and this is why it is correct. It allows you to focus on the science and show where the good science is. This is the workflow we see with this. Obviously, you do your sample preparation, data collection, solution and refinement, and your structure analysis. You then prepare a SIF and your structure factors, or in the case of powder diffraction, a powder profile. You send those to check SIF. One of two things can happen. One, it gives you a completely clean bill of health. Or two, it has alerts which you may want to investigate further. So taking the case where there are alerts, you either can resolve them or you could complete what we call a validation response form, which is your explanation of why there appear to be alerts there. You resolve the alerts, you send it to CheckSIF, goes back through the cycle, no longer any alerts go on to publication. Or in the worst case, 
something seriously wrong and you may have to go back to do the structure analysis or, or the solution refinement or possibly even the data collection again. Otherwise, you submit to the journal and go through the review process. As I said earlier, SIF contains structural data and also textual data. This is a typical set of structural data, cell parameters, weights, uh, symmetry operations. In combination with the textual information, you can go straight to a preprint of the article. What tools do we make available? Well, Simon Westrip has uh, written this program called PubbleSIF, which is downloadable, freely available, and, oops, there you go. and it's essentially a WYSIWYG editor. Where on the left-hand side, you have the SIF. On the right-hand side, you have a representation of the article. And you can make changes in either, and they're reflected on either side. It's a very useful, very well-used utility. <coughs> on the web, we also have print SIF, which allows you to have a PDF version of the paper as it would appear in the final journal. Again, upload the SIF. It, but it allows you to do more than just have a preprint. You can highlight, you can go to the bond table, highlight a bond, and it will fire up JMOL, and you can investigate further. Um, you can also do that within the text of the article. Highlight a bond within the text. It will find it, fire up JMOL, and you look at it further. We also make available the Enhanced Figure Toolkit, um, which again, behind it has JMOL. Um, this is obviously uh, a protein structure rather than uh, a small molecule. It will work, work happily for either. This allows you to prepare an animated, well, sorry, it allows you to form a static image of however you want to represent your structure, but also dynamic images as well. And the journals will publish dynamic images uh, quite happily. And this, once you've prepared your image in this way, you can upload it directly to our submission system. Everything's carried through. You don't need to worry about it anymore. And it will be published in that form. Check SIF. This, um, over the last two years, it's been upgraded so that you can upload your SIF and structure factors, and it will run the Check SIF and Platon suite to give you a validation report on your SIF in this form, with a summary at the top and any alerts, any possible validation issues it may find. And this is fully linked to um, files which give you explanations of all the tests and everything that might be going on. There's also a tool we make available um, whereby you can upload a SIF and oops, create a table in RTF form, which you can use for any purpose. You can, you can upload it into a Word document. It's a nice way of formatting all the data you've got in your SIF. You can use it in, people have used the RTF in their thesis. It's a very useful tool. Now, going back to what was mentioned earlier about fraud. Um, between 2007 and 2009, uh, we published in Atticrist E of order about 100 fraudulent structure determinations. How did we find out? <laughs> well, the nature of the fraud only became apparent when we were able to correlate the different structure factor files. Um, Ton Speck, uh, who's here, did, the, did this work, and I'll show you an example of Two uncorrelated structure factor files. Um, this is the kind of plot you'll get. Um, no correlation at all. But if you take two fraud a fraudulent structure, the genuine structure that it's been derived from, the two structure factor files you get there, to the human eye, they're completely different. But when you correlate them using Platon, you get something like that. Clearly, that kind of graph should set off alarm bells that something is going on. And in this case, this is, this is what happened. We now, because at the um, submission time, we take a SIF and a structure factor file, and with the database we have 
over the last 15 years we have all the SIFs and structure factor files we've had, we can now automatically detect this when it cut. If this, if this happens again, from the last two years onwards, if this happens again, we should be able to detect it automatically. Uh, this can't be said of all publishers because not everybody takes structure factors. Um, this slide has been shown this morning and um, I won't reiterate it. It's, it's why do we publish data. John Heller will give a very good summation of this and I, I don't want to uh, <coughs> confuse matters. Right. Publishing the data. Here we have... A, a, um, a figure that was prepared using that enhanced figure toolkit I showed you earlier. Now, this is the author's view, the view the author wanted the reader to see. And he's highlighting in here a, a distance between two atoms, two sets of atoms. And they also provided this view. They blew it up and went in and wanted to demonstrate this. The beauty of this particular system is that you don't have to look at what the author wants you to look at. You're free to explore completely using the JML engine that's behind this, and you can look at the, the view you want to look at. Quite powerful. Um, for any pub also, um, something that um, I think Brian Toby talked about this morning um, was PD SIF. What we've got here. Is, is, is a tool that the reader can generate a predicted power diffraction pattern for, for any SIF. Okay, this isn't a powder SIF per se, so that there isn't the experimental data on top of it, but this, this um, will generate a predicted powder pattern for any of the molecules we have. And again, you can zoom in and save production quality image. Now, this is my last slide. Other things, you can visualize crystallography and chemistry here. So we've got direct access to the data. So again, you're not looking at static data. You're not looking at a view that an author wants to see. You can go in and play with this yourself. So for any published structure, um, if you click on 3D view, you'll get something like this. So you've got a 2D representation, 3D representation of the molecule, you can choose ball and stick, ellipsoids, molecule, unit cell, whatever. You can collapse that down to predict. So you can turn, try and automatically turn the 3D into 2D. And then a unit cell view of this. And I think I've just finished on time. <laughs> Thank you. That's not bad because my, my clock that I've got here has actually stopped. <laughs> <laughs>